everyone, and welcome to the Roll Doll Retrospective, where we take a look at adaptations based off of Roll Doll shorts and books. I am Patricia. And my name is Aaron. Wow, it's been a long time since we've did an episode of the Roll Doll Retrospective, not since 2020 when we discussed about Roll Dolls the Witches, but now we have a new adaptation based off of a Roll Doll book that's currently in the theaters, and that is Matilda the Musical. So in honor of this, we're going to be doing a little bit of catch up. So we're going to be taking a look at the adaptations that we missed out on. Well, technically it's one adaptation and another one, which is actually based off of a true story. So... Um, in our last discussion, we talked about James and the Giant Peach, which was the 1996 uh, Disney animated film directed by um, Henry Selick, the same guy behind James and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. And we had neglected to cover the other James and the Giant Peach adaptation that came out about 20 years before, back in 1976, which was um, produced and distributed by the BBC. Well, I have to say, after watching it, I can kind of understand why it fell under the radar. Because, uh, you know, um, this... Uh, I mean, just to put some background into this, I mean, this is a BBC production in the sense that uh, it looks to me like I couldn't find any background information on this production, but this particular version of James and the Giant Peach probably would be under the same like realm as, say, you know, uh, the Look Through the Dragon's Eye and, like, the, the Look and Read uh, productions, even though, like, the later like Look and Read BBC productions will be far more high caliber than the ones that we got. But to keep this in mind, like, this was produced in the 1970s. I can probably imagine that this was produced mainly for kids who uh, were basically, you know, in school, like, trying to to understand the Roald Dahl book, James and the Giant Peach, and I could probably imagine this was done as a visual, like, perspective to give kids the, uh, the idea of, like, what the book's really about. Yeah, so this came out five years after Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and it kind of makes me wonder about if Roald Dahl even knew about this BBC adaptation of one of his most well-known books, because as we talked about in the James and the Giant Peach discussion, that... Roald Dahl was very, very hesitant on having this book adapted into screen. And so I have no idea whether that they were doing it behind his back or I have no idea on whether maybe like uh, Roald Dahl was a part of it. But once again, maybe he watched and he was like, nope, I want nothing to do with this because we wouldn't have another. We, it wouldn't be until another 13 years later in which we would have the trifecta of of. Um, Adaptations based off of the Roald Dahl books, such as Danny the Champion of the World, Breaking Point, and the BFG. So this must have really shook Roald Dahl so badly that he was like, nope, no more adaptations based off of my books. We're done. I mean, like, this is such, this thing's such an anomaly in uh, TV history because, I mean, this is, um, I, I, again, like, I don't know if this was, like, produced for, like, educational purposes more than it was actually supposed to be, like, a series. TV production, like, uh, for, I mean, interestingly enough, for a BBC production, it only goes on for, like, 46 minutes, which, you know, like, yeah. in, in, indicates that there must have been, like, you know, plans to, like, have, like, commercials, like, put in between it and stuff like that, which is really unusual, because here in the UK, I mean, on the BBC, we don't really, besides be advertising its own, like, programs and stuff like that, it doesn't really have, like, you know, commercials in the sense of, like, you know, American TV does. We all pay, like, a license fee, and that sort of kind of pays for, you know, the TV production uh, you know of the BBC itself so um yeah it's just there's so much stuff that's so weird about this uh, when th this version of this uh, TV movie of James and the Giant Peach in fact it's not really even you know it could be classed as a TV movie really it's more like a special if anything. Yeah, so, so it's very akin to the special that we talked about in the Red Roald Dahl retrospective, Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood, which was a 45-minute special that aired on the BBC in 1995 that had Julie Walters and Danny DeVito. So it's very akin to that, except coming out 20 years before. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time uh, that this uh, aired on the BBC, according to the program index, was uh, d December 28th, uh, all the way back in 1976. Yeah, so this has been lost media for a very long time, and only around 2020 or 2021 was this uploaded on YouTube. So it's only just recently that we finally got a chance to watch this, as opposed to when we did the original Roald Dahl retrospective. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I could compare it to is that, do you remember, like, the um, the Mother Goose, like, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, VHS releases and like uh, that's uh, that weird TV show that was like pre Muppets. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah if you remember that. that, yeah, like, and that was produced in New York City. Like, it's sort of like it's sort of like kind of like one of those like really like you know uh, local television productions, I guess you could say. But it was produced for a national audience for whatever reason. So it was just it was uh, yeah again like uh, you know, this whole thing is more it, it I mean this special is more sort of like fascinating from a uh, kind of like nerdy TV perspective more than it is like you know a uh, uh, like a, a historical artifact of like television or cinema or anything like that. So yes, this book was based off of the classic Roald Dahl book, but it was adapted for television by Trevor Preston, who is a very well-known English writer for um, writing films such as What the Peeper Saw, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, and Fox. And it was directed by Paul Stone, who um, I'm not familiar with a lot of his work. Uh, apparently, he's known for doing things such as like um, The Silver Chair, The Box of Delights, and Aliens in the Family, which I have never seen before. So he had his... Um, He's had his experiences with directing, and there are a lot of British actors in here that you were pointing out like, oh, I know who this person is. Oh, I know who that person is. Like, the woman who was playing, like, um, Aunt Spiker was Anna Quayle, and you were telling me, like, oh, I know her from this thing. And then the woman who played as Aunt Sponge, um, Anne Beach, you were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know these these people from this other show. I, what was it? What was it? Like, one of the actresses? Well, was one of the things like, I discovered about Anna Quayle, know? actually, were because she, she was in the Avengers. She was it's actually funny enough. Uh, she's also been like in some pretty big, you know, uh, things as well. She was in Casino Royale, and also she was in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as well as uh, Baroness Bombburst. So yeah. uh, you know, like uh, she, so she was. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say she got her teeth, you know, sinked in uh, in the BBC, and uh, then went on to like do other things as well. And then Anne Beach, who is uh, our Aunt Spiker for this, you know, she was also in Notting Hill. Of <laughs> funny enough, all but she was William's mother in this, and also she's uh, known for like Pandora's Tower, Under Milk Wood, and also the City of the Dead. So I mean, yeah. she has been in some like you know not so great productions. I mean, like she's just kind of like been uh, you know uh, an actor who is needed like you know as an extra on tv and things like that but she has done things but the one name that i found really shocking to actually find in this was andrew shacks who for those of you who don't know who he is he was manuel in faulty towers if you recall right. our faulty towers discussion he's he plays three roles in this uh, tv movie he plays an interviewer the first naval officer and a security team he actually plays quite a few roles like in this one production would you believe yeah. so uh, yeah it's kind of funny because several of the actors play multiple roles in this 45-minute special. Yeah, Christopher, Christopher Owen is the silkworm and the second naval officer, and uh, Joe Kandel is the glowworm and the American woman, and uh, James Berwick also plays an American general and the ship's captain, and Brian Fairman and Bernard Taylor all play Americans and naval officers. So, like, uh, yeah. this, this kind of feels more like... I mean, if I had to describe it, this would be something you would see in a local theatre rather than, like, you know, uh, you know, like you know um like not not like this is off 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 broadway you know what i'm talking about like you know those types of theater productions pretty much yeah. like yeah so it's like it's um it's, it's more looks like that and this is the the bbc for whatever reason decided to do a lot of these uh live action kind of like th more local theater productions is kind of like you know tv kind of like deals they did it with fireman sam they did it with like uh, various other ones as well and uh, it's just it's uh, yeah it's like uh, it's such a fascinating thing like uh, it looks more like something that you would see in a local theater with like live actors more than you would see like either a television or a movie production back in the 1970s Right, exactly. And it's not too surprising because Roald Dahl books such as James of the Giant Peach, The Twits, The BFG, and various others have been adapted into stage. I mean, like literally Matilda the Musical, what we're going to talk about next time, um, was adapted from, you know, eventually adapted into a Broadway musical. So hearing about this is not too much of a surprise. And very similar to Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood, in which that was a stage play adapted 
folded into a 45 minute special. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the similar case here in which it was originally a stage play and then it was adapted into a BBC 45 minute special. I mean, there's even music in here. Yeah. Uh, one thing also to note as well, like uh, I've heard people point out, oh, hey, you know, the original, you know, the, sorry, the 1996 James and the Giant Peach film where it took about $38 million to make. I can guarantee you when you look at this TV special, it makes no way. <laughs> the money definitely is not there. Is definitely, if it, this took $38 million to make, it's been embezzled somewhere <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah like great. it is i'm sorry but i i understand it's a tv special i understand it was done in the 70s but my god it looks so cheap i mean like, like I, I i still argue that i don't think it's supposed to be like a proper tv movie i argue it's probably there just for educational purposes and probably just there for like you know uh, to the 6 to 11 year old demographic if you will, like yeah. it just—it just, doesn't really take. Like, if this was a proper BBC production, I guarantee you they probably would be treating this the same way as Blackadder, or same way as Faulty Towers, or the same way as like, uh, you know, um, some of the other big, you know, BBC productions that would be for family entertainment. You know, like uh, if anyone see has seen uh, BBC Entertainment, like between the seventies and the and the nineties, you can see the amount of money and the amount of like, you know, uh, uh, attention to detail that they put into these shows. Uh, this is not one of those situations. I... I still believe, I, I really wish I had more info, this is one of these, like, you know, really, uh, you know, interesting situations where I would really like to, like, you know, try and find some of these people and ask, you know, uh, how did these all get produced, but unfortunately, a lot of the people who got involved in this are unfortunately have passed away. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, like, that's how long ago this thing was. Yeah, and from what I understand, I, I, I don't know if maybe I don't have the right book, but Roald Dahl does not mention this in any of his autobiographies. I, ha I haven't seen any mentions of this in the one that Donald Sturrock wrote in the 80s and 90s. Like, I mean, I've we've seen our fair share of information from all of the other adaptations he was a part of. Definitely Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and The Witches. He talked about the fact that he learned about the making of 36 hours after the making of the movie. And so um, they actually had to pay a fine for Roald Dahl so they can be able to compensate him. So, you know, you know about that information, but this 45-minute special that came out five years after Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, I cannot find any information on. Yeah, it's such an anomaly, isn't it? Like, even the B you think that the BBC even themselves would even say, oh, hey, we've had this, you know, normally they would, like, have, like, you know, quite a detailed, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, description of, like, how it's all been put together and stuff like that, but no, there's nothing. Like, there's the only thing that you can find get inf official information on the BBC was when it last aired on television was again which was back in 1976 yeah exactly yeah. so yeah let's talk about this um special <laughs> we... <laughs> oh geez where do we start so well Simon Bell plays James Trotter and he's an actor who's only been in this and a handful of other things and then say it with me he did yeah, nothing, nothing else, else. <laughs> yeah uh, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I guess this, I mean, I guess is Simon Bell, like, um, dare I say, a most successful child actor in a uh, Roald Dahl production? Because he did go on to do Dickens of London, the tall guy, and, you know, uh, he did do a few other things, you know, later on. But, I mean, after that, like, he never really, like, turned up at any point. But at least, you know, from some of the other people that we've dealt with, it's kind of like they turn up once and then never turn up ever again. Yeah, so. my goodness. I mean, what is, is Freddie Highmore and to like a so, smaller extent, Mara Wilson, the only main protagonist actors who are consistent with acting and not just one of those people who just show up once or twice and then never again. I mean, this is a major thing that we've been seeing in this retrospective. Mm. I don't know. I, I guess if you want to start your career don't be in a Roald Dahl adaptation. Just don't. Well, because if you, after this... If you if you start your career, uh, you know, before the age of 18 years old with a Roald Dahl uh, film, don't expect to go anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because unfortunately, you know, for every Freddie Highmore, you can be a Peter Ostrom and pretty much just do one major role and then do nothing else afterwards. So, yeah. And this is no exception. And some 
Simon Bell's portrayal as James compared to Paul Terry. I mean, they're completely different actors and they have a different way of portraying the character. But yeah, I would say that he's more or less stuck with the source material of the book in which like, you know, James Henry Charter is a very timid child and he recently lost his parents. He has to cater to his aunt Sponge and aunt Spiker and... Um, yeah, he's basically like very fearful of the rhino because that's how his parents were killed. And so uh, over time, he becomes a little bit more confident when he meets up with the insects and when they're traveling toward the giant peach. So, yeah, if you've read the book, he's basically portrayed that in the screen. So, yeah, I, I, the one thing that we have to say that is a little bit different from the 90s movie is that the old man is a creep. Yeah, and also he's more prevalent in this as well, which, uh, you know, and by the way, um, you can kind of understand why they limit the, the time of the screen time, I think, for this particular character. Because, by the way, uh, Arthur Hewlett plays the old man, but and here's the thing about this, like, even though he seems to have, like, such, you know, a background role in all of this, he's just known as old man, you know, like, uh, uh, by the way, for those of you who do not know Arthur Hewitt, he's uh, known for the Avengers and uh, the top, uh, no, not those Avengers, you know, like the, the older Avengers from the 1962 show, uh, he's also known for Crown Court and Top Secret, so he has appeared, like, you know, uh, on and off in uh, different in different roles, but, uh, yeah, this uh, character is so, yeah, so you know, uncomfortable to, like, you know, see. And even the, you know, the the music numbers in that kind of, like, feel more like, you know, something, like, you know, offhand is about to happen, you know, to our, our hero in, in all of this. And so, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's an interesting portrayal, I think to say. Like, uh, I mean, I know, I mean, no disrespect to uh, to Arthur, but, uh, I mean, it's just, yeah, this, um, this character is a bit, you know, uncomfortable to be around, unfortunately, you know. When yeah. The, if the old man is only supposed to be in one scene, giving James the crocodile tongue so that he can be able to make his life better. But instead of just being in that one scene, he's in several scenes and he just pops out of nowhere. And we're like, what are you doing here? You creep. Get out of here. He's, 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 almost, so, like, he's almost like I almost compared him to Pennywise from the It movies. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God, no. Anyway, so he gives him the crocodile tongues. James accidentally drops them, and that was when the peach starts growing from the tree, and it becomes gigantic. Oh, I'm sorry, not a peach, a giant balloon. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, it's a, you can definitely see it's a balloon in, in this. It's so, che <laughs> so cheaply oh my made. God. It is really, oh. really just noticeable. Oh, my and God. Yeah, it's just like they didn't even try to attempt to, like, hide some of, like, you know, the, uh, the, the, the campiness of, like, of this. It's like it almost gives back it almost gives like the the um, the 1960s batman a run for its money and like how camp it is you know yes, like it's just, exactly. it, yeah and uh, so um also one thing as well which i don't know if this is uh i mean again i don't know who you know it's been a while since i read the book but it's like is it aunt spiker or is it aunt sponge who actually discovers that there's a peach on the tree because i'm pretty sure they've mi they've mixed those up because if you remember in the 1996 version it's actually i think it was aunt it was aunt sponge who noticed that there was a, a peach on the tree and it was aunt spiker who didn't believe her in this one yeah. the roles are reversed i mean i know it's a, it's a tidbit like you know critical I guess you know, but uh, it's just interesting that uh, they you know, in some of these productions they can't seem to make their minds up about who actually discovers the peach first, and Sponge or Aunt Spiker. Yeah, you know. it's just uh, it's all over the place. Yeah, but uh, and also one thing, one thing also to note as well, you know, the whole Rhino thing that's you know got played you know uh, to hell in 1996. It's barely mentioned in this version. In, in, yeah, in which makes life. a lot of sense because it's barely mentioned in the book either, other than that first chapter in which, you know, James is a happy child. And then one day a rhino escaped from the zoo and killed and eat off his parents. That's the only mention of the rhino we ever get in the book. So, again, they're sticking closer to the book than they are with um, taking creative liberties, which, as we all know, Roald Dahl absolutely despises when anybody does creative liberties based off of his works, which is why he hated. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory in the first place. Yeah, I mean, like, well, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory would have been a lot darker in Roald Dahl's view, you know, if uh, if he had that, which uh, obviously was not that. It was uh, more charming, if anything. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you want to see a more accurate telling of that, then go watch Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, directed by Tim Burton. Mm-hmm. 
So continuing on, so um, very similar to the book, and Sponge and Spiker decide to make a lot of money by showcasing the giant peach, and James has to go and clean up the mess afterwards. And so then we have him cleaning up and, you know, quote-unquote, eating a little bit of the peach because he's hungry, and there's this giant hole that's already over there because logic. And then he crawls in, and he just so happens to see the insects, like Mr. Grasshopper, Mr. Centipede, Mr. Earthworm, Miss Spider, the Glowworm. So everybody is accounted in this movie. They're just gigantic because they're actually, you know, people in, dressed up in costumes. And yeah, again, like yeah, you know, I mean, and also they're just kind of like just sitting there, like they're in the living room. You know, like uh, it's just it's uh, it really takes away from like you know the uh, the whimsicalness of like you know the story and like you know and and everything. And yeah, I mean, I guess if they had a limited budget, I guess they couldn't really do all that much with them. And uh, I probably imagine that most of the money probably in those scenes probably went into the costumes themselves. I go well, we yeah, imagine. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, like I can get why you know the limitations in that, but good grief, it it, it looks very limited in how it's all yeah. portrayed. And like they're all just kind of just, I mean, they're just kind of sat there like waiting for you know. Uh, uh, I mean, it would have been c c better if, like, they introduced everyone individually in, in a way and, like, you know, introduced them, like, you know, scene by scene, in, in my opinion, and then had them all together at uh, that because, you know, in that, they kind of just kind of just throw them all at you at once. And it's kind of like, it kind of takes away from, like, you know, the, the unity of the individual character, if you will. Yeah. And so... Yeah, you know. and, and, and unlike the 96 version in which they all had distinct personalities, like, you know, Mr. Grasshopper was very articulate and he was a gentleman and Mr. Earthworm was a coward and Mr. Centipede was this uh, snarky know-it-all who's very sarcastic and loudmouth, and Miss Spider is very shy, and you know all those are there. And um, you know Miss Ladybug is very homely and very motherly. Everybody just seems to blend together. Like I couldn't tell apart all the insects that were in this movie. I mean, first, I mean they even kept the um, the glowworm um, in the movie, and they kept the silkworm. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, the reason why they cut the silk Silkworm in the movie was because, um, you know, that's what how it was in the book, but they decided to omit that character in the 96 version because it would have been like too many characters and it would have been really repetitive to the spider character that we already had because she already knew how to, you know, make the, the silk that they needed to catch the seagulls. The, so the, there's also one other argument I want to make here that's in regards to like, uh, you know, the, the characters are blending in together. Keep this in mind, like, you know, the 1996 version, you know, besides being, you know, a c couple of decades later, I mean, it's, uh, it's running time was 79 minutes minutes this is only has a running time of 46 minutes so it has yeah. less time to like flesh out any character development and has very less time to like you know actually that's even you know where you could and i get maybe this was supposed to be uh, you know something that was supposed to be you know displayed in a, in a school in a, you know in a school classroom and uh, you know they're supposed to be kind of like you know spending like you know less than an hour on it and then after that they'd have like 15 minutes of discussion and then that would be the end of the lesson maybe that was the intent if it was an educational you know movie but, I mean, um, in, re in regards to, uh, like, doing that, I mean, it doesn't really achieve, like, you know, saying, okay, these are here, are the individual characters, and this is what basically makes them unique. You know, you'd have to go back and read the book and get the uniqueness of the characters. You know, this really doesn't give the book... I mean, I imagine you, any movie really doesn't really do the original book justice by any stretch of the imagination, because you've only got, like, only a couple of, like, minutes to kind of, like, you know, flesh all these people out compared to what you could do with a book where you could, like, spend like an eternity like you know fleshing out characters but uh, um yeah he's like this movie definitely doesn't do the characters in the book justice or even in the 1996 movie because the 1996 movie has more time to you know be able to flesh out characters and also have cameos in too this movie doesn't mm -hmm. no it doesn't at all. So, unfortunately, you're not going to see the cameos of Jack Skellington or Donald Duck in this. So, don't even bother trying to find them. Anyway, so, um, yeah, basically it just plays beat for beat just like the book, in which when Mr. Centipede is crawling up and he's able to uh, cut down the end so that they can be able to have the peach roll around so that they can finally be free. And, you know, very similar to the book, and Sponge and Ant Spiker are crushed by the peach and they're dead. They don't appear back in the movie at the last minute and try to give off this whole speech about, like, oh, you know, we're going to take the peach with us and James, you're going to come home with us. And then Jim James basically says, I don't need you. I can be on my own. I got here by myself. So, yeah, at least we don't have that spiel. Well, I mean, like, uh, I mean, there wouldn't be time for it anyway. So, even if they did want exactly, to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, there wouldn't have been time for it anyway. And so we go over to when they are finally in the ocean and they're trying to figure out how they're going to be able to raise themselves from the sharks. Oh, I'm sorry, the paper cutouts. (laughs) Like, oh my God, it's so bad. Oh, yeah, this, you know, you're just taken out of the moment at this point. Like, it's just, I mean, you weren't even like introduced into the moment to begin with. Dare I say, I mean, like, yo, being at the house and probably being like in those, you know, at the very beginning of uh, of the TV movie, I think you probably, you know, are more it may be a little bit more invested in it maybe but the minute we start going into like you know the more imaginative parts of the story that's where it really does fall flat like you know the the this this uh, they built like this kind of like this round orange thing in there and then like put some bunch of clouds by the way this thing's supposed to be bobbing up in the middle of the ocean but for whatever reason they've made it like all white and cloudy and then like sharks like it makes you feel like it's still in the air from, from yeah, exactly. it. Like, you've not even actually got the, uh, you know, um, it, it makes me feel like they've, like, jumped, like, a scene where maybe they probably did that. Maybe they, like, designed the set and said, oh, hey, hang on a second. This is supposed to be an ocean, not supposed to be the sky, but it probably was too late to, like, you know, change it anyway. And maybe they just, oh, just stick it in that. And then, or maybe that was supposed to be, the, you know, the sky scene, and they couldn't, like, do enough for, like, you know, the, the seagulls to, like, be, like, animated on or something like that. I don't know. By the way, you know, the animals in all of this just look so fake. I mean, like, I mean, and I get it. And I guess some people are going to be saying, oh, this is something from the 1970s. Oh, it's, you know, it's got that, uh, you know, educational BBC British cheese. Of course, it's going to look, you know, terrible and tacky and things like that. But it doesn't age well by any stretch of the imagination. The, uh, the 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 uh, the seagulls looks look like they're frozen in time and look like they just kind of like just uh, photoshopped in and to me like, like do spins and things like that. The sharks look like paper sharks and they don't really look all that you know convincing at all. And uh, yeah, it just it's uh, it, yeah it, it's um. What what can I say? Like it just doesn't look very good, you know, compared to today. It's definitely compared to today's standards in twenty twenty two. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, we have bigger budgets and we have uh, much more better use of technology such as green screens and Photoshop so we can make our stuff look a lot better as opposed to like painted backgrounds and cheap looking grass and just, you know, balloon peaches and paper shark fins and just like cheaply made costumes. I mean, yeah, we've come a long way since then. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it's a bit unfair to make these criticisms because, well, mind you, we don't know what the budget was for this, you know, for this special. We don't know, like, how much and how much time was allowed to be invested in all this. Again, we'd have to ask somebody behind the scenes because there just seems there's just no information about this whatsoever. So we, we no. don't know where we don't know where to, you know, to uh, point the blame or like where, you know, if the criticisms that we're even talking about are even fair about this. So. Exactly. Yeah. So now we go over to a scene that wasn't even in the original book where, you know, James and the the Peach are up in the air and we have this battleship where you have all of these naval officers just like looking at the Peach and they're like, you know, what is this object? Is it a plane? Is it a UFO? What is it? And it's like, why is this scene even here? This feels more like Great Glass Elevator than it does, like, you know, James and the Giant Peach. And I get, like, there was a president and, like, you know, that, that whole that whole shabille. But, like, uh, I mean, yeah, this this whole thing just feels really weird to kind of, like, have that. I mean, did Andrew Jackson, like, you know, um, did they pay him, like, you know, uh, uh, like a fixed deal? And, like, you know, they had to basically, oh, let's get as much of Andrew Jackson as we can as possible. Let's just put in this scene. Yeah, like, uh, this, uh, that felt strange in itself. It does make me wonder if uh, this... You know, uh, if if this, you know, um, production was supposed to be like, not only was it supposed to be shown on BBC television, maybe it was supposed to be, maybe it was supposed to be like in theatres and maybe it was supposed to be like, you know, stage production that, you know, people would like go and pay you to see maybe. Again, I don't know. We've not got information about it, but it just seems really, really strange that it's just, it's, um, we have this reoccurring scene and these reoccurring characters when, uh, you know, that whole thing just seems a bit, unnecessary really and they didn't really go anywhere i didn't add anything to the plot yeah it adds absolutely nothing to the plot and i can get un- i can understand why they decided to do this scene as opposed to the scene that was in the book in which when they're up in the air and there's these cloud people and mr centipede insults the cloud people and then they just um were really insulted and the wind blew them away maybe they just didn't have the budget to 
anime clouds and being able to pull that but they have off. the budget to build like a, a naval scene and also have uniforms as well or maybe they sure. bo- maybe they borrowed them from another show. I don't know, but uh... maybe maybe that's what it is. Maybe they borrowed it from another show, and then they decided to just plaster in there, as opposed to like you know taking the time to animate clouds and being able to have the peach, you know, being blown up into the air and go somewhere else. So that is maybe actually one they... thing to actually point out. The BBC at the time, you know, back between the seven, I think between the sixties and the eighties, I think actually did reuse certain scenes and reuse certain props. So if you do see something in this special. Special that you saw in another BBC show. Let us leave it in the comments below and let us know. And uh, yeah. you know, you can say, "Oh, hey, that's a reference to this." Maybe I don't know. Yeah. So. Okay. And so finally, they arrive at New York City, and oh god. <laughs> Yeah, the British actor is trying to act American. Like I've seen it pulled off really, really well, but I'm sorry, these actors are just not very convincing. I can clearly hear their British accents when they're trying to sound American. Yeah, it's about as convincing as House. Yes. <sighs> yeah, it's just it's uh, yeah. Like I, I gotta be honest with you, uh, and for those of you who do not know, I'm in a wonderful relationship with uh, my co-host here, Patricia. And uh, I gotta be honest, this was like one time I actually felt kind of uncomfortable, like you know, sitting here, w- sitting watching this with her because it's kind of like here's the here's you know my stock, you know, trying to pretend to be you know the um, American and uh, in front of my you know American fiance, and uh, it's kind of like uh, yeah. This actually, from a personal standpoint, this did actually make me feel a bit uncomfortable. You yeah. Know, yeah. And, and I'm sure that I would feel the exact same way if the roles were reversed. Like, Americans try to act British. Yeah. And uh, it's just, again, like, uh, you know, they did this basically for the production. And, it, you know, I was asking, like, during the time, like, you know, why couldn't they get, like, American actors to, like, do this type of thing? It's not like Americans weren't in Britain at the time. Like, you know, they were, exactly. you know, you, you I mean, they got, uh, I mean, they got American, you know, uh, Amer- they managed to actually get Americans for certain, like, comedies and certain, like, other shows, you know, when they did, you know, when they did that. Like, I mean, when they had the Muppets show as well, like, you know, that was produced in the UK. And, uh, yeah. you know, like, and they managed to get some American, you know, were guests in, into there as well, including Mark Hamill, of all people. You know, like, uh, so it's like, it's not like it wasn't impossible to, like, bring in Americans over the over the Atlantic Ocean and be able to, like, you know, get them to act and stuff like that. That was possible at the time. So why, I mean, I guess maybe it would be, you know, again, we've, we've shown how cheap and how everything else is put together in this. I highly doubt they probably could have convinced anyone else, maybe, you know, who was there at the time to basically portray themselves, you know, as Americans living in New York City. And even though maybe there might be just the cast that maybe some of the Americans that they had just weren't convincing. Keep, keep in mind, like they would have to have New York accents as well, you know, because it's yeah, New exactly. York City, exactly. So you know, it, like someone from Texas is not going to be useful in that situation, is there? So mm, yeah, that that would sound really weird. Yeah, it, it would. Yes. So yeah, we have these um, Americans, quote unquote, um, seeing the giant peach landing right on top of the Empire State Building, and we cut in between police officers trying to dis- you know, trying to figure out what is this giant, pe- what is this giant device, um, this giant object that landed in the Empire State Building? Is it a spaceship? Are there aliens? And then James finally had to confront them, saying, no, we're not aliens. I'm a human boy. And, you know, this actually is a giant peach, and he actually, quote-unquote, fed them the giant peach, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we we totally believe you, little British boy that happens to have a giant peach and you have a bunch of insects on your side. Okay. So, yeah, that's basically how the movie, I mean, that's basically how the special ends in which, you know, finally James and the insects, they settle down in New York City and that's it. By the way, um, while they're in America, they you know they constantly keep go- going back and forth to this uh, uh, you know quote unquote American newscaster. And by the way, uh, this is Weston Gavin. And if you don't know who he is, he was the engineer from Rogue One, a Star Wars story, and also he was the mugger in Superman. Mm-hmm. So like uh, yeah, yeah, he's had some like somewhat prominent roles. I think uh, recently, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, it's so weird, like, coming to this production and then finding, like, oh, hey, this person has been in this particular movie in, like, a such, like, you know, a small world when you finally get to this special, you know, and figure out where people have been, you know, who contributed yeah. to this. 
So Yeah, it is kind of crazy to look back on it, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of like how you told me about Graham Norton when he was in Father Ted. Exactly. Yeah, so that's our discussion of the James and the Giant Peach BBC special, and wow. <laughs> but by the way, um, I mean, like, uh, the reason why we're ending it at this point, because the ending is practically... Uh, man, the ending was so weird, because they have, like, this musical number, and we didn't realize that the credits were going on at this point. Like, you know, the, yeah. the, the credits were in the background, and we were just kind of, like, concentrating, like, on them, like, you know, being at the bottom and singing, like, you know, their their final piece, and it was like, oh, wow, when's the credits going to come in? And then it just kind of, like, just ended like that. <laughs> that's how abrupt it was. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, yeah that's abrupt. the end. It's like, like, oh, okay, well, where are the credits? We want to, like, you know, figure out who's responsible for all of this. And, like, and then we hadn't realized that at the top of the screen, they were, like, going past with all the buildings and that. They actually built them into that. I'm just sitting there like, is that where all the money went? Like, building, like, these um, fantastical credits at the top of the screen? Like, just, uh, like, a grave. Wow. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, to conclude, um, I would say skip. You know, like, it's just, it's, um, it's, it, I guarantee you, like, there's no value watching this, you know, uh, from there. Maybe if you're curious, maybe I would say you have a, have a quick look at it, but I guarantee you, I think it's going to be more reactions you're going to get. Is, oh, hey, I saw that whilst I was in school. Or, hey, I saw that whilst I was learning how to watch, you know, sorry, learning how to read James and the Giant Peach and doing essays on it and stuff like that. I think that's all this exists there for. I don't think think it was like you know a super serious you know bbc production from well at least from what i can see from this yeah so this and roald Dahl's little red riding hood are definitely not good showcases of the adaptations if you want to see a good james and the giant peach adaptation go watch the disney version because that's like the best way to check it out it has much more better production much more better effects the acting is pretty good i mean i would even argue that the music is better i know that we complained about randy newman and oh the songs pretty much sound similar to everything else he's ever written but at least we actually can say one or two songs that we've actually remembered here there's a whole bunch of music that is in the special and we remember none of it no and uh, yeah, I mean, and for good reason as well. Like, it's just, it's a, it, it's either like just, you know, plinky plonky music or a piano, like, you know, uh, thing with a, with a voice, uh, with a song, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, a singing voice over it. Like, there's nothing, you know, to take away from this at all. We can't remember any. I actually still need to kind of like sometimes wind back to like figure out, like, you know, did this happen? Did that happen? Like, was this real? Was that real? Like, yeah, it's such an anomaly in, te in British television production i have to say you know so yeah. it's just it's, so, uh, uh, for all the people who said oh well oh uh, apparently willy wonka was like the final straw for roald doll and so there was no adaptations after this well here's one that came out five years later and then i guess roald doll was pretty much fed up with the point in which there were no other adaptations well hang on a second we don't know that for a fact i mean like, that's one thing that's also quite a bit of a mystery about this like did roald doll himself actually uh, give the green light for the bbc to do this like, That's actually uh, a good question. Well, we, I don't even we, know. We, 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 even the crea with the, to the creator himself, we know nothing about this. Like you know, it's just it's like here is this production. Here's everyone who's involved. That's it. Like we have no background stories. We have no one who's like gone on Twitter. No one's gone on, like either gone on social media and like said, "Oh, hey, this is what happened here," and this, that, and the other. Like you know, it's just it's such like it, it came and went. Like, it's just, it's uh, it's one of those productions where, you know, everyone kind of got involved, did something for a particular reason, and then after that went off their separate ways and then did other things that were bigger than this, you know? Yeah. But, but hey, we, we said we'd do the Roald Dahl retrospective and tell you everything Roald Dahl related, and this is one of them, so. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, consider this, finally, we have caught up with the Roald Dahl adaptations until we get over to Matilda the Musical. So, yeah, we can finally say that we have watched every adaptation based off of a Roald Dahl book. Oh, yeah, but uh, I believe we do have one other thing that we are going to talk about at some point. Yes, we have one more thing to catch up on right before we go over to Matilda the Musical, but it is not an adaptation based off of a Roald Dahl book. It was actually something that was based off of his real life. So tune in next time as we're going to be talking about Roald and Beatrix, the tale of the curious mouse.